Um, we're going to Ontario, and our next speaker is Albert DeVries, and he's going to talk to us about beekeeping at Cloverbee. Uh, to be able to talk to you guys, um, I've been nervous about this presentation for a while, and this is going to be great because in half an hour, no matter how it goes, I'm done. <laughs> Uh, Clovermead is a business that I was invited to be a part of. The uh, Heemstra family, Henry and Ann Heemstra, started in 1995. Uh, it was taken over by Chris and his wife Christy in uh, the early 2000s. There's really uh, become two parts to the business. They have an adventure farm that uh, hosts as many as 50,000 guests. Um, during the year, they do educational tours for, um, uh, I think this past year, it was 8,500 school children came over. Um, came through between uh, about the middle of May to the uh, end of the school year. Um, I started by just helping Chris out. I was just going to stay for a couple months. Um, I had been working as a carpenter for about 25 years. I installed cultured marble showers and I was just really tired of it. Uh, I needed to change. I had gone to the University of Guelph and had graduated years before, taken a beekeeping course there because I was a lazy student and it fit my schedule perfectly. Um, but the desire to keep bees stayed with me. So um, I worked for him, for, it was only going to be for a couple weeks and then I really enjoyed it. And he says to me, he says, well why don't you just stay for the summer? I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll stay for the summer and then I'll be done and I'll start my own business. And then uh, one day in the fall he came to my house and he sat on this, just, we had just, we had just bought this house in the country, we didn't have all the furniture that we needed for it, and uh, we picked this chair out of the garbage for the dog to sit on because it was right next to the wood stove. And it was pretty comfortable right next to the wood stove. And he says to me, he says, you know what, he says, you just, just do this beekeeping together. And it's one of those things you think about for about 15 minutes. Yeah, you're right. And uh, that was the beginning. Um, this picture actually is really the beginning of me getting to know him. Um, he's always held a bee beard contest, and in uh, 2010, I, uh, I got to win that contest. For me, the beekeeping season really starts, I figure it's March, we put patty on the hives. Um, we feed a fair bit of patty, we wind up probably with about six pounds on the hives in the course of the summer, so this is sometime, or uh, sorry, in the course of the spring. So this is sometime um, mid-March. You can see this, this gives you an idea of how we win, um, wrap our hives in the winter too. We take a coffee bag and we put a coffee bag on the top of the hive. Um, we feel it soaks up the moisture, but still allows the bees to go up and get that moisture, but it never really drips down back on the hives. It's also a great spot for um, mice. Mice do hang out on top of the hives, but um, they never really seem to do much for damage. Here you can see Brett. Brett's in the yard there. We're about to unwrap these hives. Um, I'm surprised how similar our pallet system is to Lauren's. Um, for us, the, the bottom of one hive clips into those pallet tops. Um, it really makes it nice for moving around with the forklift. Um, we still have all that single mono cover across, but we take the mono cover off. They're only on to move bees and um, to wrap in the winter. Otherwise, you can see in the next slide, they're just in a pile in the yard. These are black corrugated plastic wraps. They, um, they can cover two double hives. Um, our goal is to winter most of our hives as singles, but um, things happen. Um, I'll lose probably about 10% of my hives over the course of the season and we just double them up. We just find a really strong hive, put the uh, weak hive underneath it and uh, let them go on that way. Here's, here's what they look like unwrapped, right? just a, a pallet of singles there. Uh, a lot of those hives will get doubles put on them. We've always thought that if we have strong bees and we never really know how we're going to make our money each year. We've sold a lot of hives over the years. We also will collect pollen. Um, we do honey some years. That's the way beekeeping goes in Ontario. We never really know exactly how we're going to make our money. May 1st, 
I, uh, I intend to get all my pollen traps on by May 1st. So we run about 700 pollen traps. This is a new design. We're, we're quite happy with them. We did find that probably they need a little more ventilation. But uh, we go through all our yards just putting, putting pollen traps on. And the idea is we want them on before the dandelions bloom. The dandelions, again, are, I saw that in Lauren's slide, they're a bellwether plant. Um, we all talk about, oh, are the dandelions there yet? And um, we're very happy to see those little dandelions come along. Um, it means to me that I've made it through winter. The, uh, the ground is starting to firm up. It's easier to get in and out of the yards. And the hives can start to get a, a surplus of honey again at this point. Um, uh, it also begins the uh, swarm season. Here's a, a pictures of, I always thought before we ran a lot of pollen traps that dandelions were really, really important. And this is a picture of mostly dandelion pollen. But you can see there's the lighter yellow and that's a lot of tree pollen. Um, it's interesting, we get a lot of information from just looking at pollen traps and just seeing how it changes. You, you, can, you can empty a trap, empty a tray and just see that. They switched part way through um, the week and the pollen has completely changed. Pollen is collected on pretty much a weekly basis in the spring when it's really coming in. We need to get it more often. The, um, the, the pollen will sometimes spoil. Uh, so if we know that there's a lot of pollen in the traps and that we have rain coming, we're just going to send someone out there. It takes about a day for a person to make it around to all the traps. Later on in the season when we get them all out, because at this point we don't often have them all on, sometimes we still need to build up and get stronger. Um, so later on in the season it takes about a day and a half almost for a person to make a complete round. The pollen sits in the reefer here, every bag is labeled with the yard and the date. In the fall, in the off time, we'll start cleaning. We, have, uh, we dry it first. So we have two streams of pollen too, really. We have pollen that's going to go to bumblebees because the pollen from the knapweed, we have knapweed as well. The knapweed is so bitter, it's just not anything you want to eat. So pollen from knapweed um, goes to bumblebees and then it's, it's probably about three quarters of the pollen is suitable for human consumption. So we'll clean that. Uh, we have a seed cleaner that we run it through and then we have a specific gravity table. The, the gravity table is a, that's a really finicky machine to run. It's a 1940s all over gravity table. I don't have a picture of it in operation. There's so many things to adjust on this and the pollen is changing all the time. Um, I, fig I figure the only thing, the thing works properly for probably about 15 minutes each year. Um, but it still does a great job. It separates things that weigh different weights. So the clean pollen moves to the top of the table and the chopper moves down to the bottom. At the same time that we're trying to put all those pollen traps on, or just after we've put them on, we start with our queen rearing. Uh, we start selecting breeder colonies. Um, I think one thing that we really need to improve on is keeping better records. Uh, we, don't, we don't keep a lot of records for our hives, and I'm thinking I would like to put a little plastic strip on the top, and that will work out a code system not dissimilar from Danny's, and, and track our hives that way. But here's my little grafting hut um, in the foreground. I don't. I hope you guys don't lose respect for me as a beekeeper, but we actually do have a little pet raccoon there. And uh, that raccoon actually loved coming out to the queen rearing yard. I would just throw it on my shoulder, this is right by my house, and uh, it would just wander around and come back out, find me when it was about time to go. Um, it's really my daughter's raccoon. When we do select, one of the first things we look at is the pollen trap. Again, a lot of good information there. We look and we see how strong um, that hive is by just how much pollen it's collected. We look and see how clean that pollen is. And uh, if we like what we see, then we will pull the um, inner cover off and we do a hive inspection without smoke. If we can get through the hive without smoke and we've not been stung, then we'll mark that hive as a potential breeder. We'll watch it for the next couple of weeks. If 
um, if we find that it's heavy, we like the way it's working, the like the, the way it's building up, we bring it back to the home yard. We are we're members of the Ontario Bee Breeders Association. We're really, really lucky that we have this tech transfer program that's just wonderful. So I'll get probably about 13, 14 hives home. Um, a couple of them aren't aren't going to make it into the breeding program yet. So my goal is to have 10 tested for uh, to see how hygienic they are. The, um, they come up, they do hygienic testing. It used to be that when they first started years and years ago, that a hygienic bee was like 70% hygienic. But now we don't really even consider um, looking at hives that are under anything but 90% hygienic. And quite often you're looking at stuff that's removed 95, 98. We had one year where we had a couple that removed everything. They were 100% hygienic. And it's pretty exciting stuff. And I really, I don't think I can take much credit for it because it's because so many of the bee breeders that went before me and we just bought breeder queens from them. And that's how we started out. But now we have our own breeding program. And since we have our own breeding program, we see that we don't have near the, um, the swarminess. We don't have as much chalk brood. We're still struggling a little bit with chocolate, we'd like to see less, but our bees are gentler, they're more productive, and uh, I certainly enjoy working with them a lot more. Um, we use cloak boards as well. Um, I'm too cheap to go out and buy a piece of plywood, so I talked to my local MPP at the end of the election and said, hey, you've got damaged lawn signs, can I have your lawn signs? So we use the corrugated plastic, we slide it in um, Yes, I do have a Dutch heritage. <laughs> um, everybody's got a brain. So this is uh, uh, Joanne that does a lot of my grafting for me. Um, you'll see a picture of Joe later on. Um, she missed one on this one. <clears throat> she missed one on this one, but uh, I got to give credit to, to the, uh, the design of, of the cell frames that we use. It's Paul Kelly, University of Guelph. Um, I don't know, does anybody have a Paul Kelly B belt? There we go, one in the front, got a couple in the back there. Um, most amazing things ever, there's a whole bunch of us that have them. And um, we'll actually get up to a bee yard and realize we forgot it and just turn around and go back and get it. We just don't want to work without them. We make up quite a few nukes. Um, we sell nukes to the general public. Um, a lot of hobbyists want to come in and want to get them. Sometimes. I can't always be there, so we've just put a piece of tape on this tape and said, hey, to the person, come and get it. Um, the thing that I've done, though, and I, I don't want you to think too much less of me here, but I have a family, and I want to enjoy my family. I want to go to soccer games. So we tell people, we're only available on Thursday night, and you can come and get your nukes then. And people say, well, no, I can't come and get my nuke then. And it's like, well, that's all right. Don't worry about it. You can come next week, Thursday night. We'll have nukes for you then too. And it's really amazing how many people adjust their schedule and all of a sudden, oh, I can make Thursday night. <laughs> but we're also, as members of the um, Ontario Bee Breeders Association, able to take advantage of an isolated mating yard in Huntsville. So these are queens that came from Huntsville that uh, we use. This is how we bring new genetics into our operation. Um, in the springtime, we're back, we're back to about the beginning of May again. These are bees that just came out of a cherry pollination. We do some cherry pollination. We are, we are, like we are pallets. We, uh, we've gone to New Brunswick in the past, but we find that it's just easier to put pollen traps on and stay at home, get some regular sleep, rather than collect all your hives, equalize all your hives, and put them on a transport truck, watch them go away. So these just came back from cherries, and they come out as cherries really fantastic. We've gone into some apple orchards, so these guys insist on spraying all the time. And um, we've since just dropped some of those guys and just said, listen, sorry, we're not going to have bees for you next year. Um, you can just go find your bees from somewhere else that when they're spraying all the time. They just don't come out of, uh, out of the pollination all the, the same anymore. We like selling hives. Um, over the last uh, years that I've been running the operation, we've sold over 3,000 hives. Uh, one thing that is really nice too then is a lot of our equipment is new and our frames are really new. We don't have a frame replacement program. We simply just sell the stuff all the time. 
But I'm always surprised how sometimes those old crappy boxes are still around. So uh, this year we called out a whole bunch of them. It's really hard to collect pollen when you've got a box that has holes in it. Um, another beekeeper one time, he, uh, he had a tough winter and he had lost quite a few hives. So we took a lot of his dead outs and we filled his dead outs for him. It was great. He shipped them down. But the thing is, he put them on their end and these things leaked syrup everywhere. And they were the most awful, gooey, terrible things to have to deal with. Um, when I put this presentation together, I sent it to Joanna. Joanna has a look at it and she says, it's so great to see those silver boxes going again. She was so happy to see them leave. But you can see, you can get an idea here too. This is a uh, right two hives stacked on each top of each other, two pallets, and uh, we'll go as many as four high on a low boy trailer. Um, you can get 512 pallets on uh, one transport truck when uh, when you load them like this. We move our hives a fair bit. I have about 22 winter yards. And uh, then we go up to about 37, 34 this year of uh, summer yards. Uh, typically, we stock a yard to about 28 hives, um, 32 in some of the locations that we know are going to be better. Um, you can see Amanda there walking over, and Joanna's hiding in the background. Um, here's Amanda and Joe blowing bees. <clears throat> um, I really love working with these two girls, they're a lot of fun. Um, Joanna keeps on going back to school on us though, and I need to be able to get through a winter somehow with, um, with having her around and I get to look forward to that next year because she's, uh, she's not going back to school next year. There's us loading our trailer. Um, that's our forklift trailer, but um, we like it. The deck is really low and it's a lot easier to load in. Um, we only pull about 80 supers in a day. Honey production is really not what we focus on. It just happens to be a byproduct sometimes. Um, this past year, we did kind of go for honey a fair bit. Um, so far, we've extracted about 30 barrels, and I imagine we have another probably 50 to go or so. Uh, works up to about a 75 pound average per hive. Um, the best I ever did was um, uh, 100 and uh, 175 barrels. This is our hot room. Uh, hot room holds about uh, 500 supers. Uh, our extracting line, um, you can see the milk tank in the background, holds about five barrels of honey. Uh, it just sits overnight. We really don't strain much of anything. It goes into barrels. We sell all our honey to the adventure farm, so it's a separate business. Um, I need to be profitable and he needs to be profitable, so we just work out what honey is selling for, and that's what I sell my honey to the farm for. There's a great picture of Amanda. Um, I got a call today saying she's extracting right now, and um, Amanda's pretty new to all of this, and she says this extractor's making funny sounds. Uh, it turns out the clutch just needed to be tightened up, so it was really great that she's back in business again. Um, we really like our Cooks and Beals wax melter. Uh, our, our cow, it's a little cow 28 that we're using. Um, 175 barrels means somebody was chained to that thing for weeks on end, just pushing five barrels through it every day, every day, five barrels. Um, we changed the spinner on the bottom, though we have a little paradise wax press. We lose probably 1% of our, our, our honey, so if I extract 100 barrels, I maybe get one barrel of burnt honey out of the wax melter. Uh, some of the problems we face, we are in the middle of prime agricultural land. Um, there's not even a lot of livestock because these guys just choose to crash crop. Um, there's a new pest that kind of has moved in in western leaf cutwort. They spray it with, for it with helicopters. They'll be spraying fungicides uh, mixed with insecticides. And uh, I often get a lot of dead bees. Um, it, it's not terrible, but I, I get a lot of bee kills. This actually is not from the helicopter. The helicopter bee kills are generally pretty light. Um, this is from them spraying corrigin onto sweet corn right across the road from Queen Rearing Yard. I had an order for 300 queen cells that was in the middle of producing. I had done the graft, and then uh, the hive, the yard just got decimated, and uh, I had to cancel that order. One of the things I found really disappointing is the the 
farmer was certainly willing to talk to me, but he was contract growing, and uh, the, the company he contracted to did all the spraying, and they wouldn't return my calls. They didn't want to talk to me at all. And I don't want to be a jerk about it. I just wanted to figure out where it went wrong and what we could do to avoid it the next time. One of my things that I lose most of my hives too in the winter time, our winter losses are generally around the 15%. We had an amazing year one time where we were only 5%. But um, uh, it's drone layers. When a queen goes to drone laying, now this is not drone laying, this is laying workers. But I just thought it was, it's kind of a cool picture that you can take with your phone. We do sample for mites a lot. After August the 1st, we kind of have a policy where we're not going to help our hives anymore hives have to make it on their own. We will take a really good hive though that has gone queenless. Because we run the pollen traps, it's very hard for a hive to requeen itself. So I have to be able to catch those. But we do stock some of the yards with mating nukes. And um, we can pull queens out of them during the year, but then in the fall, it, it seems that after about the middle of July, I, I, I can't replace a queen in a hive. The queen won't accept that hive. It just, they won't do it at all. So we just let those ones go. Um, quite often they get piled underneath, but then this time of year we're getting more pollen again. It seems that bees are more receptive to uh, a queen being introduced. So we'll plug a hive. We'll plug a nuke right back into a hive. Um, the mite sampling is really pretty simple, right? It's just a shaker jar. We use a wash tub. You take a frame. Sometimes you take two frames. You just put it in there, uh, shake the bees in there, and then uh, see who leaves. The uh, younger bees are the ones that I actually want to sample, and I put them in the shaker, shake away. Um, and we've been quite happy. Uh, we control our mites with um, organic acids whenever possible, resorting to uh, synthetic strips. Um, that's kind of a last resort. Uh, here's a picture of Joanna. She's looking for a queen that um, returned to that pollen trap but stayed in the bottom. They started building comb in the tray. That. And this is not an uncommon thing. Uh, about 30 seconds after I took that picture, Joe found that queen, and uh, we managed to get her on the right side of the pollen trap. And uh, I believe that hive will do just fine. Um, sometimes we get a little bit behind. Um, the, the you saw the picture in the spring. That was Brett. Brett quit midway through the summer, so it was just Joe and I and a thousand hives. And when you're rearing a lot of queens and doing a lot of pollen traps, um, sometimes you get behind. So. It's really nice when you get this little surprise, you open up this small split from uh, this year, and uh, there we go, ta-da, we got a whole bunch of honey there. Uh, we have a one inch space that is beneath our uh, inner covers that we use, and we find that sometimes they build brood comb, so it's just a natural way you just remove that brood comb. Sometimes there's mites in there that uh, they don't get to get back into that hive either. Um, some of the equipment we use, it's all about material management, really, when you come to beekeeping. It's just a lot of stuff that needs to be moved a lot of times. So we have this little forklift. We rent a space inside a, a tobacco warehouse. And that tobacco warehouse, it's, a, it's kind of dark, it's kind of gloomy. There's 25 acres of the place, and uh, we have one small little corner. So when you're ordering syrup, or you're getting sugar, or you're getting something delivered. There's five different loading docks. Um, it's quite the place to be able to find someone in. Uh, here's a picture of my uh, my two prime vehicles, the little Honda we use for collecting pollen, and uh, that truck's a 2010 Ford diesel. It's the most I've ever liked the truck. We bought it used. The engine has been uh, rebuilt, and uh, uh, it's quite the towing machine. We hope we have a 24-foot trailer, and we have that little tilt trailer that we pull around all the time. But uh, the majority of the, the supers go out on an old snowmobile trailer, and I don't have a picture of that at all. Um, we did buy another truck. This is, a, again, it's a 2003. Um, the engine is gone in it, and as I speak right now, it is, uh, it is getting the engine replaced. Um, as I like these old trucks. I don't feel bad about scratching them up at all or anything. And uh, we've had great luck with these rebuilt diesels. So um, that's the end of my presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions.
just wondering what the market is for all that pollen. Uh, pollen is very easy to sell. We, we never have a problem. Um, we sell it in barrels to other beekeepers. We also sell probably about three barrels ourselves. Um, what I'm thinking of doing is starting to package the pollen in smaller quantities so uh, I can charge more for it. <laughs> Okay, well, seeing no more questions, thank you.